Hello. Do you happen to have a fantastic idea that you'd like to patent and eventually develop? My name is Daryl Gangadu. I'm the director of the Media Lab for Advanced Review, and I'd like to invite you over to my lab so we can discuss more about it. Come with me. So, today we'll start by talking about the geographical scope of patent filing, then the definition, of course, followed by the methodology, and uh, we'll spend some time on writing, but also drawing uh, your pa patent application, the associated costs to filing a patent, and a couple of examples. Now, there are quite a few patent offices worldwide, some national, like, for example, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, the USPTO, and some others that uh, regroup a few countries, like, for example, the European Patent Office, which includes the British Intellectual Property Office and uh, all the other European ones, of course, regrouping multiple countries. One that is up and coming and that I have a lot of high hopes for is the ARIPO, the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization. Then, overall, there is the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, that uh, does a lot of coordination of all of these regional and country-based or patent offices. Now, each of these entities have reciprocal agreements between each other. And uh, if you file, for example, a patent in the US, you can get its reciprocity in Europe. For today's conversation, however, we are going to focus on primarily the US patent law and also how it differs to the European patent laws that I personally am a little bit more familiar with. While there is an official definition to obviously what a patent is, a granted by a government that allows an inventor to maintain a monopoly on the use and development and so on, I sort of simplify the, the definition by saying, invent something awesome, explain how you did it, be the sole owner, and get rich, before the term expires, of course. Now, you might have an idea, and that's awesome, and that's great, and that's where it all starts, but you really cannot patent an idea. What is patentable is a little bit more than that. First of all, your idea needs to solve a problem that is useful. And then, it uh, should not obviously be already invented. Um, this uh, you can find out by doing some research on prior art uh, in, um, in your patent offices. And the third main concept is that your idea should not be extremely obvious. There are five simple rules for the methodology. The first one is research. First of all, you need to find out what's the demand for that idea that you have. Does it have a unique intersection of different industries? We're talking here of different vertical markets. And the more unique industries that your idea intersects, that's a good chance of, of wider success. Is the current market flooded with similar ideas? And yours might be just a slight variation of it. How is it unique, desirable, and inimitable. What that means is not being able to easily be copied by another market or in the manufacturing business. After the research, you've got to dive deeper into the trends, what's hot right now and what will be popular in the upcoming months in your market or industry. Will it be still trendy when your minimum viable product hits the market? Third, opinions. What do other people around you think about your idea? Obviously, be careful here. Don't divulge too much of the information. But it is useful to question people that you trust and accept harsh criticism as constructive. 
when you converse with another person about uh, those ideas, make sure that you've got some documentation signed, like a non-disclosure agreement. It will help you specifically if you are filing in Europe. It is very important that there is a track record showing that you haven't been sharing that idea too much. As an inventor, this is a time to look uh, introspectively at your own personality. As you might remember, for those who attended the Hive Camp event in Berlin last year, I had this geeky approach to the whole entrepreneurship perspective by looking at it as if it was a periodic table of elements. As you would recall, I identify the personality of the entrepreneur or the person with the ideas as the first few elements of that table. So from a personality perspective, you can be a perfectionist, a giver, a performer, a romantic, an observer, a trooper, an Epicurean, a boss, or a mediator. And that determines how you interact with other people and how you also interact with your ideas. It is important to find advice from people that are on the opposite spectrum of your personality, even if you would not gravitate to them naturally. Next is to plan. And, uh, you know, we can spend a whole hour on just planning your steps here. But in reality, it is your step to producing your first minimum viable product. The components to your profitability, external investments and costs are what needs to be looked at and scrutinized very much at this stage. You might want to look at stages of your product and possibly even a couple of exit plans based on some benchmarks that you would have defined initially. Last but not least is actually building some prototypes of your idea. Now, initially, you'll want to uh, draw some of those sketches and then expand those drawings into non-working prototypes. You can use quite a lot of material for this. Uh, as advanced as a 3D printer, but you might start as simple as a couple of Lego blocks or even uh, some Play-Doh or clay. Foam is often used in the industry as well, so uh, the sky's the limit there. So, to recap, do your research, know the trends, ask for opinions, make a plan, sketch and build. One great way of getting through these is by implementing the methodology of design thinking. While this is out of the scope of this presentation, I have quite a lot of books to recommend on the topic. The one that helped me the most was probably Design Thinking for Strategic Innovation by Idris Muti. There are three kinds of patents uh, that you can file for. The utility patent is the most popular one. It involves inventing or discovering something, a new process, a new machine, or an article of manufacture, it, uh, or a composition of multiple metals mixed together, so an alloy. The next type of patent is called a design patent, and it is more for ornamental um, use. And the third kind of patent is called a plant patent, and it is mainly granted to anyone who invents or discovers or is able to reproduce any distinct and new variety of plants. As you write your patent application for the US or the European market, there are quite a few differences between the two, and you are, however, able to write in a way that fulfills both requirements. There's a few items that need to be understood before you start writing. First of all, in Europe, the first person who files the application wins. So if two people come up with the same idea, one files it and the other one waits a month to file, um, the person who files it first wins. While in the US, two people can file, but the system allows for an examination of logbooks and uh, protocols in your lab to see who is the real person who invented it before. Uh, and then it's granted to that person. Also, in the US, you have one year of 
grace period where you're able to talk about your invention, lecture about it, and even publish uh, some aspects of your invention without affecting the fact that you can uh, claim uh, the patent for it. While in Europe, if it is publicly available before the patent is filed, it is automatically void. If you want your patent to also be granted in Europe, make sure you don't publish it uh, in advance. When you uh, apply for a patent, it is automatically published 18 months after filing it that you have uh, been granted the patent or not. In the US, you have a method of not publishing the patent that is not available in Europe. In the US, you have a requirement to describe the best way to practice the invention. While in Europe, you are required to have one way of using or practicing the invention, but it is not required for it to be the best way at that time. In the US, when you submit uh, a patent, it obviously covers all of the US states. In Europe, it covers 27 countries, those who have signed the EPC agreement. But if your um, patent needs to be annulled, you need to do that in each and every country in Europe, while in the US you do it once and it covers all the states. If there is a challenger or um, a query about a patent that has already been filed, in the US it is a conversation between yourself or the patent holder and the United States Patent Office. While in Europe it is a conversation that can only happen within the first nine months and it is between your, the patent holder, the challenger and the European, European Patent Office that is based in Munich. In the US, when you apply for a patent, you need to de demonstrate that uh, the patent is novel and that it is not obvious. While in Europe, you have a few other requirements. Uh, one that, it, uh, apart from it being novel, it needs to also uh, have an inventive step and it also needs to solve a problem. In uh, the US, it's the patent application is a single form, while in Europe, there are two parts to it. The first is a brief description of the, uh, of the patent and the second part is what's called a claims list. The claim li claims list has uh, extra information about what is it improving, um, what are its extra features, and a listing of prior art. As you write your patent application, be thorough. It's actually pretty hard to amend a patent after it's filed. Sometimes professional help uh, is uh, actually quite welcome. Quite a few options are available online, but be careful of the scammers. In your documentation, feel free to refer to your drawings. Include them on separate pages. And when appropriate, include uh, chemical, mathematical formulas or algorithms, especially when it's connected to software. Here is kind of my cheat sheet on what to include in uh, my patent applications. You want to have a title that is very easily found um, when people search for patents. So don't name it after yourself or anything like vanity, things like this. In the technical field, that's where you want to put uh, a broad statement of the, um, of the technical area that you're working in. Background information, this is where you put a lot of the prior art. So if you're using any previous uh, patents inside of yours from other people, uh, make sure you include those kinds of patent listings. It's important to describe in details how your patent solves one or many problems out there. You want to basically describe how it's new and improved without using the term new or improved. Make sure you list your illustrations by number and description and then a detailed description of your invention, which is really the key to your intellectual property. List an example 
uh, or the best example in your mind of its intended use, including warnings necessary for the product to work properly. Kind of like a lawnmower, don't stick your feet in, uh, underneath. Way back, drawings for patterns were very elaborate, colorful, and even showed facial expression. Nowadays, they are very rudimentary, simple, and usually black and white. If you do have to refer to colors, however, you can use different shades to allude to a particular color. If you don't feel like you are talented to draw, you can use companies like the patentdrawingscompany.com or even hire a person on fiverr.com to do that kind of job for you. But what helped me the most was this book called Drawing Ideas, a hand-drawn approach for better design by Mark Baskinger and William Bardell. They helped me simplify my drawings and uh, turn them into something that the patent office would be happy with. When it comes to cost, however, it is not as simple as you'd expect. The European Patent Office has a listing of its costs in a PDF file that is available here at the bottom of the screen. The equivalent American listing is also under the USPTO.gov website, also listed at the bottom of the screen. You will see a lot of different costs under the section Patent Searchers. These are useful to find out if your idea or a portion of your idea has already been used or not and there's naturally a fee to be paid for that search to be done. And now for some examples. Since 2012-2013, I've been absolutely fascinated by virtual reality and, uh, and how to create it and make it uh, very sustainable. And uh, I had been toying back in 2013 and 14 with a few GoPros. And um, what I've decided to do is uh, try to see how uh, with little wooden bricks I could assemble a method of capturing um, images from all kinds of directions. That turned into a 3D printed product that allowed me to connect seven GoPros together and uh, generate a 360 image. And that um, interface required some software that would stitch those images together and create a single 360 video that could then be used for virtual reality experiences. Mind you, that's way before consumer VR goggles like the Oculus were invented. So here are a couple of drawings that were part of my European patent filing. Notice uh, here on the left we have a flowchart, some equations, and uh, an actual drawing of the um, contraption. I even had then uh, patented the concept of putting GoPros at extremities of a drone outside of its field of view of the propellers to be able to get 360 images from way up. But eventually I used a different algorithm that could erase in the sky. So this is how an actual drone was flying with a GoPro contraption. But uh, we also had some incidents, accidents with uh, this contraption. And here's an example. Nonetheless, it got me to be involved in some 360 productions in Myanmar with the refugee camps uh, throughout Europe and uh, also in Lesbos, as well as some projects for the British government, as some advertisement for Adventist colleges and also the US National Park. As another example, I'd like to call my friend Andrew DePaula via Zoom to have him tell us a little bit more about his invention called the IntelliPaper, and that is embedding of electronics inside regular paper. 
At IntelliPaper, they like to say paper just got a lot smarter. They're talking about the digital world and marrying it with something tangible for transferring information. Derek Dice has the details on this company based in Edwall, of all places, in our latest edition of Made in the Northwest. When you think of the town of Edwall, you might think of cattle ranching or wheat farming. What you definitely don't think of is a company like IntelliPaper, based in that building right there. The first company in the world to embed digital flash memory in ordinary paper. IntelliPaper filed its first patents in 2008 and started selling to the public in January. Well, it's the same kind of stuff that you would have in a normal USB drive, but we've taken all the cost out of it. Their manufacturing process is well guarded, but in a nutshell... We take a top and a bottom layer of paper printed with um, whatever information the application requires, and we sandwich them together with an adhesive. The electronics go on the center layer. And at the end, um, you've got a, a sandwich, basically, that includes all of the electronics and yet still feels like a common piece of cardstock. IntelliPaper products like the tear-off card or the new swivel card could revolutionize the greeting card industry, allowing you to load pictures or video messages. Advertising mailers could be sent with specific information for specific demographics. And as they try to stay ahead of the curve, IntelliPaper is already making products that are near-field enabled. Near field is basically a similar data transfer mechanism, but it's wireless. It doesn't require any physical connectivity at all. DePaula has grand visions for his company as he hopes to make their products an integral part of everyday life. If, if we're blessed with success and the company goes the way that I believe it can, um, we, you know, IntelliPaper will become a household name, and that's, our, that's definitely what we're trying for. Good morning, Andrew, and it's a pleasure to reconnect again. Now, Andrew is also an inventor, and um, Andrew, would you like to tell us a little bit more about these things that happen to work even better when they are folded? Several years ago, God gave me an idea that can, among other things, revolutionize literature evangelism. Intelligent paper. From that idea, IntelliPaper was born to create a new avenue to make our truth-filled literature appealing to today's generation. Over the past few years, through exhaustive R&D and extensive field trials, we have perfected this idea and we are now on the verge of launching the latest generation of this product. We have sold and distributed over 300,000 units of IntelliPaper product containing Adventist literature both here in the U.S. as well as in some of the hardest to penetrate atheistic, communist, and Muslim countries. Our success rate exceeds 99%. <laughs> Well, so years ago, um, when I was working at the Upper Columbia Conference here in uh, the Pacific Northwest of the United States, um, we developed a little sharing tool, it was a little square CD. Um, and, you know, those were neat, but... Was that in the days of Bible Info, right? Yes, it was in the days yeah. of BibleInfo.com, that's exactly right, which, by the way, is still a website. Going Absolutely, yeah. But um, yeah, back in those days, we developed this little sharing tool, which was just a little mini CD um, that was, you know, cut square and uh, it would work, you know, back when CD trays came out of the computers, you could put it in there and it would, it would work and it, we had content on it. Um, but, you know, that went by the wayside uh, as technology does. And I, you know, there was such, there was a cool factor to that little CD that I was really disappointed we had lost because- It looked different than, than the regular CD and it was about the size of a, of a business card almost. I, I, I was looking for something that had a similar pizzazz, a similar wow factor. And so fast forward several years in January of 2008, I'm at uh, CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. In Las Vegas. Well, yes, going through the exhibits, looking for cheap, USB thumb drive technology. Thumb drives were around. Um, well, not for mass dis distribution, huge quantity. Well, and that's what I was looking for. And I discovered that there was just a price floor that you know you, you couldn't break, even if you bought gazillions of them from China. And so um, back in my hotel room, the Lord gave me an idea for a paper, well, a paper electronic circuit board, basically. Was that through a dream, Andrew, or was that while you were awake and it was like a... Well, I'll tell you how that happened. 
I was fiddling with the badge they give us for, uh, for uh, you know, all the attendees. And um, it was a cardstock thing, but then there was a lump in it. And I'm like, this is weird. And so we were done. And so I tore it apart and there was an NFC tag inside. <laughs> huh. From way back uh, then, huh? <laughs> yeah, and one of the long range ones. So with the big antennas, I mean, this thing was six inches, well, not quite, maybe four inches long with a tiny little chip in the center. And they, uh, they, they'd been tracking us, you know, as we came and went throughout the show. Well, you'd expect hit, it, the, the consumer electronics show to, to be the first ones to be using those kinds of technologies anyway. Sure, no, I would expect that. But, but in that moment, it came to me, I was like, if they can do this with a name badge, why can't I make a paper, a paper circuit board, paper USB so, drive? So the challenge with paper is the thickness, I suppose. Even a business card needs needs a bit more thickness for it to work in a USB key. Oh, that's not the only challenge. There are many, many challenges. Paper uh, as a substrate is just not conducive to electronics. Yeah. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's, it's a fibrous, porous, flexible, uh, it shrinks and grows with temperature. I mean, there's all kinds of weird stuff that goes on with paper. Um, but, you know, we, we've solved all those challenges over the years and patented a bunch of intellectual property in the process. And God has given us a paper circuit board that can, it's, this widget is not that much different from this widget in a, in a conceptual way. I mean, this is full of circuit boards and components and whatever, and this has got all the same basic uh, pieces, just implemented in very different ways and much less costly. And so, so you know, we have a reference implementation, which is this USB USB thumb drive, but mm -hmm. it could be most anything. So Andrew, from a from a patent perspective, um, was it just one patent, or there were a, succe a succession of patents that made it possible? Um, we've got probably over 15 patents now. Um, so it started with one, actually a couple. And, uh, but we've grown the IP portfolio from there. You obviously uh, were and still are wearing many hats uh, in the company, right? And uh, from manufacturing uh, to the business side and the, and the promotion of it. Um, to also developing what's coming up next. I remember visiting uh, your place uh, once and you had some Lego contraptions. Uh, um, so uh, I, I was pretty, it brought a smile to me anyway when, when I saw that because I do very often similar things, stealing some Legos from my kids sometimes to, yeah, no, to get a prototype. I'm working. being not too happy with me on one of those contraptions. <laughs> Uh, from the perspective of developing uh, the patent and so on, um, do, did you outsource any of the legalese aspect of it or did you do it all yourself? You mean the, the, the legal part of the patent itself? Right, the writing of the paperwork and the, oh, the drawing. You know, it's very difficult to get a good patent that can hold water, um, you know, if, as the expression goes and stand up to whatever challenges you might face mm -hmm. without a good legal team. And we have a good legal team. Yeah. Um, but as you first got the idea and started uh, your process of, of filing your first patent, did you have that team back then or were you? I had done some previous work uh, right out of Walla Walla that uh, had explored that field a little bit. And even though nothing ever came of it, I learned a lot of the ecosystem. And so I was introduced to one of the best uh, patent firms in the Pacific Northwest at the time. And, you know, so I, I, I gained a lot of background that I was able to put to use when Intellipation yeah. came around. Well, well, we'll come back to the whole discussion of the education aspect a little bit later on. Uh, as a reminder, Andrew graduated from Walla Walla University, or was it college back then? Um, and yeah, with Walla Walla College when I yeah. <laughs> and uh, possibly our best at Venice University uh, from an engineering uh, and also software perspective. Um, so uh, from from the concept of creating a patent, uh, Andrew, 
um, very often what we see uh, in a global sphere um, is that uh, a patent might be filed in North America. I'm, I'm pro probably more familiar with European patent laws and, and filing patents in Europe. But from your perspective, as you filed this patent in, in uh, the US, were you at all afraid of infringements, maybe from, uh, from Asia or from other parts of the world? You know, actually, we've always, I've always taken a global perspective on our patents from the very beginning. And we've done it both ways. We filed in the US first and then extended it abroad. Uh, but we've also filed uh, through the EU, well, it's not the EU process, it's the PCT process out yeah. of Geneva yeah. that uh, by treaty and convention covers the entire world or can, it's the path anyway. And so then come back to the US from there and other countries as we saw fit. And so, um, you know, our patent coverage is very strategic. Um, we went after either countries that have manufacturing capabilities or that um, have large markets. And so, um, you know, I wouldn't say we have universal coverage because, you know, that's cost prohibitive, but um, we have very good so Andrew, tell me, um, has there been any uh, lawsuits that you have filed from um, some patent infringements at all anywhere uh, in the history of IntelliPaper? Not to date. Um, we've been blessed actually that most of the, or the industry appears to be going a different direction than we are. Um, uh, frankly, that's probably part of the reason why this space was wide open we plugged a hole in the ip space that was just nobody it was dark um and it's because of you know the way industry uh thinks and goes and the things that they're doing no one really ever thought of this apparently so we haven't had to we haven't had to go after anyone to, anybody yet but i keep my eye out you know never say never as they say good um having visited your your factory and without revealing much of the history of the, of the secrets of how you put this together uh on the surface, it might sound like it's an, e it's an easy uh, method of copying, but in reality, it is quite complex and you've had to surmount quite a few uh, physical or mechanical challenges uh, for uh, the substrate to stay um, uh, intact pretty much throughout the, the process. So kudos to you, Andrew, for, for having uh, developed that uh, uh, unique method of uh, to be uh, honest with you to be honest with you Daryl it's God that has done most of it I've been his instrument um, I'll tell you uh, a story just from that I mean this is very real the hinge mm -hmm. the hinge that uh, is in these things came to me one night not in a dream but as an answer to prayer um, we needed to solve a particular problem with the hinge that the original one, the original ones were breaking off and right. They were fragile. Well, it wasn't just that. It's just like you need to, to be to in the standard USB interface. And now, you know, we can support USB C and, you know, NFC and, you know, whatever all else. So this is back, you know, several generations, but the original uh, USB standard interface requires a minimum thickness and you can't have a good feeling card that's that thick. You know, it's, it, feels, it feels too thick. Yes. Um, and so we needed a hinge that would develop the thickness. And so, uh, like I said, I, I spent hours trying to figure that out, went to bed completely frustrated um, and prayed. I'm like, Lord, you need to help me because we need the solution. We had some deadline we had to deal with. And I have it in my journal. The next morning I woke up with this hinge in my head. It's the one we use. The one we use. It was simple and yeah. yeah. But it works. Mm -hmm. What would you have done differently? You know, I'm not sure I would have done much differently on the patent side. We, like I said, God, God has been through all of this. And so as I look back, I really can't. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a normal guy, right? I don't have a lot of background in the um, patent space before this, you know, life experience. Now it's been... It's been 10, 11 years, so you know I've gained a lot of experience over the years. But as I look back, there's it's like a forest or a minefield, and we threaded the one path that was safe to go through all of it, and that's not human wisdom. Sure. Um, so, so I, I, I honestly don't think I would do too much different on the patent side. We're very well protected, um, and we have 
and it's not over. So, you know, as we develop further and as we go forward, we can continue developing the IP and, and, you know, digging deeper moats and building higher walls around, you know, what God has given us. Um, so I'm, I have no complaints there. You know, if I would do one thing differently, it would be, I would have already had our own chip. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, you reference, you know, some of the clips that uh, we have in the video that we that we're going and and that's the main gist of where we're at now is, in order to get the cost down to where it can really go out to the masses, um, we need we need to uh, manufacture our own ASIC, um, and that's the final that's the final piece to the equation. Sure. The rest is all done. Um, the manufacturing of your own chip does not. Um, does that uh, require further patents on your end, or uh, it is just a matter of doing it in house, therefore reducing the? Yeah, no, it's it's the same. It's the same. It's the difference between. Let me think of an analogy. It's the difference between. Well, let's say you're building a car, right? And you're a new car manufacturer, like like Tesla, for example. You know they started up recently, and so you. Uh, you design the body, you have this beautiful look, you know, you know exactly what you want, but you buy your engine from General Motors. And, you know, General Motors is in the, to make money too. And so they're going to sell you their engine at a, at a profit margin. And unfortunately, the market will not bear what it costs us to sell that car with the General Motors engine. And so um, we've done everything else. It's all done. But once we have our own engine in house and you know that we make then uh then the margins will be in line and, and we can we can do this yeah so uh in practical purpose um for commercial entities to want to use intelli paper for products um what's the price point right now uh per card uh if they for commercial entities that is we were we were selling them uh, for about uh, two dollars roughly per unit, but there again, um, while in in some cases that was appropriate, it wasn't widely sustainable, mm -hmm. even in the commercial space. And so when we realized that, we decided, all right, we got to go back to the drawing board, and we got to get this chip of ours out. And there's really, you know, other than keeping the engineering going and the patent portfolio going and what have you, there's really not much point in doing much sales until that's resolved. And so that's what we're focused on now is, uh, is getting the chip. Excellent. Andrew, tell me a little bit more about your education at university. Um, you, did, uh, you did an undergrad in electrical engineering, is that correct? That's right. Um, electrical engineering degree, which, and a, almost a computer science minor. So effectively I have a computer engineering degree. Yeah. With that in mind, uh, did engineering school help you at all? Um, not so much in the, in the prototyping or in the electronics of the circuitry, but in the legal aspect. You mentioned briefly at the beginning uh, that there were some, uh, some contributions from, from your college. So elaborate a little bit on that. Well, it, it wasn't so much the formal education as it was, I've always been, a, my dad was very handy and I picked up a lot of that from him, I believe. Um, you know, when I need to invent something, especially if it's touchy feely, mm -hmm. I'll often go to the hardware store and just browse the aisles for things I can, you know, uh, MacGyver was my favorite show back when okay. I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you come out of the hardware store without having bought anything, it gives you inspiration as to. No, but and and many many times, you know, I need a solution for something, and I'll grab a bit of this and a bit of that, and I'll go back to my lab and and you know I'll carve it up and hack it up and put it together, and I have something that works, and it might not be the final product, you know, it's not you're not going to build something for the public out of the hardware store necessarily, but it's certainly a prototype. And it probably performs the function. I mean, the same thing with the Lego stuff that we mm -hmm. built. You know, that was, that was to replace equipment that, uh, you know, cost thousands of dollars that, you know, there was no reason since I had Legos. <laughs> and now you have a, a 3D printer, I presume, and you can uh, yeah. prototype. Well, we, we, we've certainly evolved from those days. Yeah. <laughs> what happened right, out, right around school is I, 
I was playing with some ideas that I was interested in patenting. And so in that environment, you know, I had access to teachers and faculty and what have you. And so I was able to get myself introduced to that ecosystem. And even though, like I said, that, you know, nothing went anywhere at that time, um, it gave me the background I needed for Intellipedia. Do you reckon that it would be useful for uh, Adventist schools that have an engineering program to have in its curriculum a little bit of, uh, to cover a little bit on uh, on the legal aspects of what Absolutely. it means to be- Absolutely, we should do that. In fact, um, Washington State is ideally suited for that. Um, uh, you know, uh, Walla Walla being in Washington, Washington State University has uh, an innovation assessment center, which is uh, which is an organization that they use uh, uh, grad students and faculty to staff, and for very little money they can evaluate an idea and uh, and you know provide some good solid foundation. And I actually in Telepaper went through that in its infancy. Uh, yeah. I, okay, and that gave you uh, more assurance to proceed i suppose no it was on the strength of that that i invested in the first patents absolutely great andrew thank you for uh, that recommendation to to uh, the educational aspect of, of schools i hope that some uh, uh, educators uh in the audience can can weave those concepts into their curriculum um andrew last but not least i'd like to ask you uh, what would you uh, consider as a recommendation or as an idea or ideas to a young budding, uh, maybe a late teen who has a great idea and wants to to see it come to fruition and maybe um, might be motivated by by the financial lucrative aspect of uh, of owning and inventing something and uh, and proceeding that way. What what would be your advice to them? So honestly, if you're looking at an invention just for the financial, don't bother. Um, you stand the chance of losing your soul. And that that's is so true. I didn't, I didn't go after this because of money. And I'm still not motivated by money. And if there's anything that happens with Intellipaper, it's because God will have done it. Now, at the same time, I've been thrilled and delighted to have been on this journey. Um, I've done things and stuff has happened that I never in my wildest dreams would have would have imagined. I mean, I have miracle stories coming out my ears. And, um, and so that's been extremely rewarding. To answer your question in a practical sense, you know, there's a lot of practical advice that I could give, but you need to make sure your motives are right, at least. <laughs> Christianity and this message we claim to, to, to preach matters. Andrew, thanks for your time. And thanks for reminding us of the Christian ethos that we ought to keep in our business practices. At this time, I'm open for questions and answers on uh, anything you want to know about patents and uh, how to file them. I don't claim to have all the answers, but we can definitely dialogue about this. So the time is now yours.